that if you didn't know what the program this evening was all about, it's sustainability. So just making sure you're in the right spot. Everybody in the right spot? All right, here we go. Andrew. Thank you. I got no spot. Because I am from the EPA. My name is Andrew Geller, and I will accept a general outpouring of sympathy. Yeah. <laughs> I am saving the uh, taxpayers money by not providing slides tonight. Um, and so I'll tell you that I, 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 grew up, I grew up in suburban New Jersey in a house with a brook that ran behind it. I went three backyards down, took a sharp left, had no name. It was a place where I could go to avoid my three sisters throw rocks, whack the skunk cabbage with sticks, and when I got old enough, travel all the way to the end where it spiraled into the muck and leaf meal and disappeared. If I had lived even one street over, my life would have been different. That brook was an essential part of my sense of place for the home I grew up in. And tonight I want to talk to you about another creek, uh, Proctor Creek that is also an essential, plays an essential role in the sense of place for a neighborhood in Atlanta, Georgia. Proctor Creek runs entirely within the city limits. Its headwaters drain the massive impermeable surfaces of the Georgia Dome, the CNN Tower, and the Atlanta Federal Building, and it runs to the Chattahoochee River. The community around Proctor Creek has a sense of place that's one of stigma. Proctor Creek is rife with persistent flooding and erosion. It's, uh, it's got deteriorated housing and mold. There's crime, there's disinvestment, and there's depopulation. For my organization, for the EPA, it's out of compliance with water quality issues. Well. The community around Proctor Creek decided to dispel that sense of stigma. They, um, they, there was a, a, a coalition there called Park Pride, a coalition built of community members, of community organizations, and they put together a master plan to actually heal the Proctor Creek watershed. They began with a cleanup effort. The community got together and removed thousands of tires and other detritus from the stream bed and the stream banks. But then they prescribed a solution. They prescribed for the community. They prescribed a road diet, narrowing the roadways and putting in bike lanes to slow down traffic and make the community friendly for, uh, for business. They prescribed permeable pavers and green swales and trees to slow water runoff, to, uh, to increase retention. And they designed in green space and space for community gardens. Their goals were more than water quality. They're really looking for reducing flooding, reducing heat stress, and improving air quality. They're interested in traffic safety and safety from crime. They're interested in access to goods and services and access to green space. And at the end of the day, they want to increase both economic capital and social capital. And all of this spells out one critical facet of sustainability, the overall goal, community well-being, increasing the quality of life for everyone who lives there. Now, their solution is one that's called green infrastructure. Um, Green infrastructure is essentially using design that mimics nature to address civil issues. Um, and when you think about infrastructure, of course, you're thinking about the long term. We put in roads, we put in pipes, and we know they're there forever. Long term is another key element of sustainability. And in designing a green infrastructure solution, uh, Park Pride was betting on a third aspect of sustainability, the nested relationship between a healthy economy existing within a healthy, resilient society dependent on a functioning ecosystem. 
To hedge that bet, Park Pride was joined by EPA and a consortium of federal, state, and local agencies to do a health impact assessment um, using stakeholder input and broad expertise to evaluate the potential impact of the, product, the project on all of the, uh, on all of the community's goals. And what this HIA showed was that the community evolved project, this green street and street diet, would likely have positive and long-lasting impacts on traffic safety, on climate and temperature, on air quality, on exposure to greenness, on access to goods and services, with additional benefit for flood management, crime, and social capital. So after the initial assessment, the city decided to actually triple the length of the Green Street Project. They decided to define the whole area as an environmental uh, district to encourage the use of green infrastructure um, in the whole Proctor Creek watershed so that they would maximize public health benefit across social, economic, and environmental factors. Building a sustainable community, ultimately, that has a positive sense of place, that's conferred by these tree-lined streets, shading active walkways and bikeways and businesses with green spaces and with uh, community gardens, and of course, with a stream where you could go and fish and chuck rocks and cool your toes. So at the end of the day, what they designed in was a, what I think of as a just sustainability. Uh, a healthy economy built inside a thriving, engaged community within a functioning urban ecosystem for the long term conferring health and well-being for everyone who lives there. Thank you. All right, two questions. We'll fix that. There we go. There we go. Two questions. First, was that you? Was that half? Half? Okay. Sure. Do you want it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, is an environmental district a thing? It is. There's actually, I, well, there's there are eco districts, and I think that there are, and, and, and a growing community that looks at environmental districts. The the, the eco districts community and organization actually is one that has as its core values uh, equity, addressing climate, and addressing resilience. And it expands from there. And so this, this, this idea of an, an environmental district or an eco-district is one that's growing and one that's really putting together these issues of community and economic vitality together with environmental functioning ecosystems. On the left there, I see we might have time for one vote. No, it came back up. Hi. Yeah. Um, RTP is about to do this big redo here in RTP. There's a creek that runs right through here that's very hidden. Are you aware of that and what they plan to do with that? How they're going to broaden its appeal to the green space and all that? And if so, if you are aware, um, are you with it? Are you against it? I mean, I, I am not aware of it. I would be totally for it. You know, I used to ride my mountain bike. I, I, I try to make my own trails back behind the EPA and, uh, and, 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 and bushwhack through there and, and, and the muck and mire and pull a few logs out to practice doing that. So, uh, so adding, uh, adding some ecosystem services to the RTP area would be a welcome thing and I will, I will chip in with sweat equity or whatever else is needed. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Next up, we have Katie Martin. Katie is an assistant professor in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources at NC State University. All right, you two, there we go. Ladies, yes. That's the only time I will ever do that. She is a watershed ecologist whose research focuses on sustaining clean water, carbon sequestration, and species habitat in forests and across landscapes. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Katie Martin. Yeah, I have slides. Uh, in my culture, we always have slides. Um, I'm on a stage and I have a microphone. I, I don't know, am I Celine Dion? I don't know, this is very different. 
This is very, most of the time when I talk about my research, it's at a scientific conference. It's a little different culture. And so what I'm gonna to talk to you today about is, um, is my passion, which is natural resources in the Anthropocene. And so when I was invited here to talk about sustainability, I was like, well, that's interesting because I'm not sure that I believe in sustainability. Um, just because, not that I don't want to um, have a good environment for people going forward into the future, but sustain sort of implies that things are gonna be similar. And most of my research suggests that's not true. So maybe adaptability would be the title that I would um, be more comfortable with. Um, but I do like trees. My, my, uh, my bio there was maybe a little more for a scientific audience, but I just love being outside. I love being in nature. So that's how I got started in this whole thing. I just wanted a job where I could be in a forest with my dog and no other people. <laughs> and so that's what I did in grad school. So I studied hemlock woolly adelgid, um, which is an insect that's removing eastern hemlock, a tree that occurs from Alabama um, in the mountains up north, and it's been there since the last glacial maximum, which was 10,000 years ago. And somebody decided that they wanted a Japanese tree in their yard. And accidentally, they brought a bug over. And now the entire eastern forest is reshaped. Um, so I was always kind of interested in the decisions we make and um, how they affect the environment. So when we talk about the Anthropocene, it's really geologists that get to decide how to divide up history. And they're still debating whether they believe the Anthropocene is, is a thing. But I think it's a useful concept. It just means it's a period in history where humans are the major driver of the Earth system. And when we investigate whether that is a useful concept, we think about this graph. How many people see this graph in their sleep? <laughs> so in science, I think we're, we're just so motivated and we think maybe if we show you our best graphs, then you'll listen to us more. Um, so this is one of our best graphs. Um, and so this is called the Keeling Curve. It's named for a scientist um, who set up a monitoring station on a mountain in Hawaii, it's the Mauna Loa Observatory, to measure the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide. And he set it up in 1958. And this is the level of carbon dioxide that is sensor measured in Hawaii on an island on the top of a mountain away from any sort of industrial influence. And since that time, We've arrived at this level. So this is the last reading um, when I was preparing the slides. So it's 402 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And as you can see, that's quite a bit more than when the sensor was set up. But if we want to get really technical, we can use ice cores and isotopes of carbon and oxygen to try to determine how much concentration the atmosphere had going back 800,000 years. And this is where we are. So this is the record from ice cores going back 800,000 years. And this is where we are today. And that's why I question sustainability, and I suggest maybe adaptability would be something we might want to consider. Because we're in uncharted territory. It's intimidating, but it's also motivational. So what are we going to do? This is the reality that we have. So what are we going to do going forward to ensure that humanity has a high quality of life? And so the questions that motivate my research particularly are whether high quality fresh water will be in the right place at the right time is increasingly uncertain. And water is one of those things that is essential. And it's something that is questionable even in North Carolina. So you may think of the Southwest. I don't know, I wouldn't move there. <laughs> but in the Southeast, we have a chance, but we can't let it pass. So this is the US drought monitor for November 8th. And so the increasingly deep colors of red suggest there's more intense drought. And so you can see our state is involved in some of this. And as a result, it's on fire. This is the smoke from the fires in Western North Carolina, and there's one in Northern Georgia. Um, in the past week. All right. 
Um, and so, um, I can go on all night. Um, but this is the situation in the western part of the state. And we know in the eastern part of the state, we kind of have the opposite problem. So this is about a month ago in Lumberton. This is Interstate 95, underwater. And so we have a problem with too much water. We don't have enough water in the western part of the state, and we have too much water in the eastern part of the state. And this is sort of a lesser of what we think the future will hold. So global climate models are pretty accurate at measuring the change in average global temperature, because that's a global phenomenon, and we're talking about average temperature. And it happens at such a large scale. What's difficult is measuring precipitation, because there's so many local um, processes that go into that, that we're not very certain of what will happen. But what we do have high confidence is that we'll have more extremes. So we're facing a future of more droughts and more floods. So we need to prepare for both, even in the same state at the same time, which is challenging. So most of my research is how forest management might mitigate some of those effects. This is my only very technical slide. Um, usually they're all very technical. But I study the impacts of not only climate change, but land use change. As we have more people moving in and they need ecosystem services, things like clean water, clean air, from forests that are shrinking, what are we going to do? Um, this is the watershed that provides drinking water for Greensboro. This is the Piedmont Triad International Airport. And this is current. So the green is forest, the yellow is agriculture, and the increasingly deep colors of red are development. This is what we think it'll look like in 50 years. And so you can see that it's a lot more red. Um, and so we did an experiment, most of my research is experiments and simulation models. Um, so projections of the future. So it's just, it's similar to a computer program that just takes information like, how many leaves do we think are there? How much photosynthesis occurs over each area of leaf? And so how much water are the trees using? How much impervious surface is there? So when a raindrop falls, will it run right off of the surface or will it penetrate the soil? That's all included in the simulation model. And we test whether managing the forest might improve things. So this is, an ex this is under normal conditions, the black bars. The orange is under an experimental drought. And the gold is an experimental drought plus forest management. So we're seeing some options as long as we keep forests on the landscape. They may provide a source of flexibility to adjust to the future. And I'm already over time, so that's what I have to share with you today. All right, time for two questions. I'm in the back, so if you're also in the back and have a question. No? You? No? Okay. Didn't mean to put you on the spot. It's okay. Oh, there's some up here. Here we go. If you were going to tell this crowd what the two or three things we could do to help adaptability, what would they be? Well, I mean, first we need to get all minds on board, right? So the discussion of what is happening in the future in science is over. But science is all about debate. We don't know exactly the details of what's going to happen, and we certainly don't know what to do about it. So if we could move more people forward, from whether or not something is occurring, and more towards what are we going to do about it? What are solutions that come from different perspectives? Um, that would be one step, I think. All right, one more question. Saw a few more hands up front. You're closest to me. <laughs> so in your technical slide up here, you're predicting a, a, a much greater amount of deforestation in 50 years. Yes. Are there any, any like suggested paths to prevent that amount of deforestation? What is it we can do to, I mean, we're not going to reduce expansion of people very easily, right? So how do we keep the, the forests in place? Um, so this is a scenario where the development will occur in accordance with previous patterns. So one thing would be to look at different conservation development type scenarios. So one thing, um, you know, I like being out on my own in sort of a rural setting, but I know um, from a land use perspective, high density development 
is advantageous because if people are using a smaller footprint of land, there's more land available to maintain forests. Good. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Katie, you and I have one thing in common. I too, every month, get up here and pretend I'm Celine Dion. <laughs> every third Thursday, I wake up. I'm Celine. Love it. I'd sing you a song, but I'd spare you. I have, this is a great job. This is a fantastic job. If you get to pretend to be Celine Dion every third Thursday of the month, that's a fantastic job. Another, uh, I guess, guilty pleasure shirt I'm wearing from The Bachelor. Sure is. Yep. Okay, moving right along. One, one person also watches The Bachelor. Everyone else? Lying. You're lying. How many Bachelor fans? Really? No one. See, one. Ryan back there. I know Ryan wa Anna watches it. Michael watches The Bachelor. I know Michael watches The Bachelor. Come on. Oh, man. And people. You guys having fun? Who's learning a lot? Yeah. All right. Jorge, you ready? Okay. Jorge Montezuma is an environmental engineer passionate about transforming organic waste into usable products. He is originally from Peru has lived in South, Central, and North America, and studied engineering in Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, and NC State. See, you messed me up back there. You got me. All right, did I do okay with that? Okay. Thank you. Sweet, yes. So, my name is Jorge Montezuma, and I work for the North Carolina Department of Environmental Ecology. <coughs> and I work with a great, non-regulatory group that all that we do is we provide assistance uh, technical and in terms of funding to local governments and businesses that are looking to expand the recycling <laughs> efforts. And I focus on organic waste. We're hiring, so if you want to know more details, talk to me afterwards. Um, so the, the talk topic is uh, let's talk dirty. But before we talk dirty, let's talk clean. And I'll ask you to come with me to the supermarket. So we're going to go to a supermarket where modern people, the urbanites, go to harvest, right? So we're going to go harvest some potatoes, get some eggs, get some milk, get some beets, get some pickles. And then we're going to get home and let's just save some time and throw 40% of it away. Because that's how much the average American throws away about 40% of the food they buy. That's a lot of food. And let's keep in mind that one out of six of our neighbors is food insecure in North Carolina. So where's all this food waste going to? It's going to the landfill, sanitary landfills. I was a solid waste engineer designing landfills for a little bit, learned a lot about it. A lot of people would say that it's fine, you know, landfills are just time capsules, that they're resource storage units, that somebody in the future is going to mine them. But you know what? What this means to me is that we're not honoring all the time, labor, energy, and resources that went into making all of those packaging products and all that food waste as well. And we sort of need to change that cradle to grip approach. I studied environmental engineering, like Will said. How many environmental engineers in the room? Two, three, maybe four. Sounds awesome, right? But in reality, all that we do is we clean up other engineers' pollution. Okay? We really need to change that. Uh, luckily, corporate responsibility and accountability on waste is changing, it's improving, and we need a lot more of that. So let's get back to uh, trash talking the trash. So why does it smell so gross? Why, why is it dirty? Why is it gross? Well, what's in it? We've got some metals, and eh, we've got cardboard, and eh, we've got plastics, and eh, it smells a little bit. We've got some paper, we've got leftovers, ah, jackpot. We've got food waste. Pretty much anything that has remnants of food in your garbage is going to be triggering that stink bomb. So you have that shrimp that you made last night, you have the shells that stinks really bad the next day, you've got some leftovers that you have from the restaurant that you never ate, you've got those strawberries that are just molding in the back that you threw away, all of that is going to be smelling. And what we're really smelling are just the farts of microbes. So let's be real. We, uh, we place food out there, we invite the microbes, they come, they party, they eat, they play, and poof, there goes the gas. These are some fancy names that we're giving some of those gases, like hydrogen sulfide from that rotten egg smell, uh, and some other ones. 
Some other byproduct from that anaerobic decomposition coming from the microbes is methane. Uh, methane, we know that it's a super critical uh, gas that is, has a huge effect in our changing climate. And I won't go too much into details, but all that I'll say is that in the US, a fifth of the methane emissions are coming from landfills. That's huge. And uh, for me, methane is kind of like that, uh, that, that guilt that you feel when you do something that you don't want your parents to find out about. Uh, methane doesn't smell, it's odorless, and it's invisible. That guilt is invisible, it's, uh, it's, it doesn't smell. But you know that in the future, it's gonna come back to you, and it's gonna be really bad. So that's kind of what methane feels for me. So um, let's take a closer look into food waste. So if we separate the food waste, this is sort of what we get. Sorry for you guys on the back. This is in Charleston, in South Carolina. This is food waste, about 15 tons, made by a couple of grocery stores and some school cafeterias. Let's so take a closer look. Some food waste coming from a grocery nearby. We've got some stuff that is edible. This is stuff that, uh, that I would eat. Um, and we're allowing this. We as a society are allowing our grocery stores to stock up produce from the time that they open until they close with awesome looking stuff. And we, the consumers, go in it and we pick and choose all the stuff that looks really good. There's a little uh, rotten speckle, we don't buy it. If there's a freckle or maybe a wrinkle on some produce, we just don't touch it, we will buy it. We want to get the beautiful stuff and we leave behind the ugliness. We also expect the restaurants to serve anything on their menu from the time that they open until they close. And the kitchen has to be stocked up, ready with all the food, ready to serve us anything on the menu, even if we show up 30 minutes before the kitchen closes. So just wonder how much food waste is coming from those grocery stores and those restaurants. Luckily, we've got some awesome organizations and businesses that are doing something to recover that food. We've got food rescue organizations like Interfaith Food Shuttle that is donating that edible excess food to people in need. We've got some businesses that are using excess agricultural product that is left in the fields to make things like sweet potato vodka or purees. We've got people that are feeding it to pigs and cows. Uh, we've got anaerobic digesters that are making biogas to generate electricity or put it back into the natural gas pipeline. And the one that I particularly like the most um, is composting. Mainly because our topsoil is eroding super fast and we can feed them soil, sorry, we can feed them compost uh, so that we prevent that from happening. And also soils have an incredible capacity to sequester carbon. They can be huge carbon sinks and we need to exploit that. Compost is basically farming with microbes. And the end product is dark, rich, super nutrient dense material that we can apply on soil, which should not smell. It should smell like this dark, rich uh, soil from forest. It can be placed on top of the soil. It can help improve stormwater runoff. It can feed the plants and the soil microbes. And it can also help us close the farm to table movement by going from the plate back to the soil. So, my challenge to all of you guys is that when you get home, take a look into your trash can, when you go into your workplace, when you go to your favorite restaurant, check out your trash and check it out and then give me a call and we can talk dirty. Thank you. <laughs>
sorry, if you apply it on 5% of the range lands, you can offset the emissions coming from the residential and commercial areas in California. Um, I can't talk too much about the amount of carbon that is coming out, that would be coming out of the permafrost, but I think we need to keep thinking about ways to sequester carbon that are microbiologically directed. So how can we work with microbes in the soil by not disturbing it, by protecting it, so that carbon can be sequestered by their actions. One more question. I see front row, but I want to give somebody else a chance. You look like you really want to ask a question. How about I just pass it down? Why aren't they harvesting that methane gas and using it to good use at the garbage dumps? Many of them are. Uh, typically, when you collect landfill gas at a, at a landfill, you don't do it for the first few years because you're still building on that phase. So it's an active phase, and you cannot install collection wells because they're really expensive. Um, so you don't want to build it you know, in year one because that area still has a life of five years. Many times you're going to build on top of that layer to make your landfill bigger, so you don't want to remove that collection well and put another one on top because it's really expensive. Um, and the efficiencies are about 75% at best. So, so they are, but you know, they're not necessarily the most effective way to do it. Thank you. So, since most of you have been here before, you also probably know that I do love a good joke. And when you Google corny sustainability joke, nothing really comes up. But since he just talked about trash, we'll go with what has four wheels and flies. A garbage truck. <laughs> flies. Not impressed, are you? Okay. <laughs> Guess what, Ricardo? You get to follow that. Good luck. They're warmed up for you, buddy. It's okay. Ricardo Hernandez is an assistant professor in the Department of Horticultural Sciences focused on sustainable horticultural en energy and controlled environment production. Ricardo Hernandez. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Like uh, he said, I forgot your name, but uh, I focus on control environment and sustainable energy, whatever that means. You know, when they advertise the position, that was a description, so I went for it. So uh, uh, today we're going to talk about growing plants indoors, and uh, there is a lot of claims about sustainability. Some of them are true, some of them are not. But I'm not going to go there. I want to keep it on the on the on the upbeat. So we're going to look look on a different uh, area. So when I when I say indoor farming. You probably picture something like this, right? This is a farm in Indiana, Green Sets Farms. Or something like this. This is a farm in the Netherlands called Delicious. And they produce the lettuce seedlings in those compartments, and then this, this machine robot brings it out to the greenhouse to finish them. Or maybe you're picturing something like this, Green Spirit Farms. They're located in uh, Michigan. A little, a little less technology, but it's still considered a vertical farm. Or you may consider something like this, a local, right? based in North Carolina, crop box, they're producing leafy greens inside containers. When I think about vertical farming, I look at this. So this is what my research does. We look at all those components that make, that allow plants to grow indoors and try to find interaction between them. However, you only need to remember seven of these components, right? Light quantity, light quality, which is the color, we, have, we need light quality to control the development and the morphology. Also temperature for the metabolic rate of the plant, right? Humidity to control the transpiration, right? Uh, we need also uh, air velocity. We want to manage the leaf battery layer to improve photosynthesis. Uh, nutrients in water, and of course, atmosphere is CO2. Only seven. Really, you don't have to remember any of them, but light. Because today we're going to talk about light. So why light? On a plant factory, 85% of the electrical consumption is used for the light to grow the plants, right? So to control the temperature, to remove the humidity, we only use 10% of the energy, right? 
So HVAC systems have become very, very efficient, so it's not such a big deal to move the water around, to provide the plants with the nutrients, and to circulate air, we only need 5% of the energy. But again, 85% of lighting. Now, now with the new LEDs, the, I just checked yesterday, the most up-to-date efficiencies, we can knock that down close to 60%. So we're doing better. But what I'm trying to do in my lab, I'm trying to leave the same amount of resources going into the plant factory, but just change the color of the light, right? So if we want to probably spend the same amount of electricity, but I want to play with the colors of light to see if I can achieve something else. So here you have a cucumber seedling. We grow them under different percentages of red light and blue light, right? So the first plant over there is grown under 100% red light. Oh, give it away. <laughs> thank you, right? thank you. I told you to wait. Okay? So you can see very here, if we increase the amount of blue light, we have a more compact plant. That's a desirable characteristic. We also went into those plants and measured the amount of photosynthetic rate, right? And we found that with the increase of the percent of blue light, we have more photosynthesis. But we also found that with the increase of percent of blue light, we have less growth, right? I know I was like, oh. Anyways, we figured out why. It would be because of uh, the leaf area. Now, over here, we grow plants under 100% blue, blue light, and I was going to expect a plant even more compact. But we even found something like this, right? So we moved the red out of the equation, and now we have a very stretched plant. And this plant has the same amount of growth that our best plant, which is 10% blue light, right? But it just went out, it went crazy, stretch on the struggle plant with great growth rate. So we go ahead and investigate what happens to that. Now let's start something more pertinent to food production. So this is less. Grow down the same exact environment. The only difference is the color of light. Right? So what we're trying to do is try to find the light that will produce you the most fresh mass. Right? So when, when, when uh, Whole Foods buys lettuce, they buy it by the weight. Right? So growers, they want to treat Whole Foods and say this plant weighs more, so they create a plant with more fresh mass. We also, try to, we also, those plants right there have the same amount of fresh mass. So what happens with fresh mass? Their cells have more water in it. Right? Now, we also, I can tell you that this plant has the most anthocyanins, right? So the most nutrition plant is coming out for that plant that grew in that specific light recipe. But even to make it more interesting, that plant is the biggest plant. The most growth rate, the most cell, the most carbon sequential is on that plant, right? So even more than this one, and this one, and this one. So these are just more stretch. So with the light quality, I can implant stretch, just they're compact, or make them create, or be more nutritious. Just by changing the color and maintaining the same inputs, trying to help the sustainability. So another, another good example. So these plants were grown under white light, right? Fluorescent lamps, you have a couple, well, everyone, I'm sure everyone went to LEDs, but just uh, fluorescent lamps, right? So they were on the white fluorescent lamps, and a few hours before, before we turn the lights off, we provide them with blue light. Or far red light, which is between uh, uh, 700 and 800 nanometers. Just a little bit of it. So we're able to increase the nutritious, 26% more anthocyanins, 12% more carotenoids, and a same amount of uh, biomass and everything else than your control. Now with far red light, we actually decrease the nutritional capacity of that plant content, but we increase the growth. So what, what do we do? So let's do a combination. Right? So now we, in, uh, we don't have any effect, so we have the same amount of nutrition that we control, but we still increase the growth rate. And I think um, the table there is looking for this, but since I grab it, I think <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Way more slides. <laughs> so what is the application of my research you want to put into the to the entrepreneurship sector. <laughs> so here I grew some tomato seedlings indoors, right? And we find out not only the perfect light recipe, but also the perfect combination of all the other environments. The same, the same that you're supposed to remember, right? So we find the perfect combination. And then uh, the startup took that recipe and they started producing grafted vegetable seedlings, right? So grafted plants, just like your wine that you like so much, they're grafted into our restock. We can also do that with vegetables. Right? So what happens is that you create, uh, you have uh, uh, your favorite tomato on top, and then you have your wild type tomato that has very crappy fruit, but great root system, right? So we grow them up to this size, 
We cut them in half and we glue them together, right? So there is difficulties in doing this. No, actually, they cut and put them together. That's easy, just tedious. But growing the plants to be at the same stage so they're ready at the same time. So we found that recipe. And now these plants are substituting uh, fumigation on tomato fields because now you have a rootstock that is turned to diseases and pathogens. So what are the current efforts at NC State? So we want all those parameters that you talked about. We want to create a small facility that can serve us to train engineers and to train students and to train entrepreneurs on how to grow plants indoors, right? And it's not going to look like, like, a, like, a, like a building like that. It's probably going to look like a, you know, like a repurposed cold storage or a, or, or a garage or even a, you know, a shipping container. So I want to create that capacity for all of us to get to play with growing plants indoors. And that's what I have. And, uh, and uh, um, just click on it. Yeah, just click on it. Thank you. And I open the floor for any questions. You forget my name, you steal my wife's triangle. No time for questions for you. All right. I know, hold on, let's see if there's anybody. Okay, I see you. All right. Okay, we'll get. All right, you can go again. You, do you take, you hold it, the mic? It's not the mic I'm worried about. No, oh, yeah. damn. <laughs> He's a triangle. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, earlier you mentioned um, fluorescent lights and LED lights, and then you mentioned red and blue lights. Are you having success in finding LED light sources that provide the spectrums? that you need to use, or are they still not available in, in those colors, in those spectrums, in the quantities that you're, that you're looking for? Yes, so as a researcher, we can, we can find pretty much everything that we want. But to, to flip the question, most of the wavelengths in the visible, in the visible spectrum, they're, easily, they're found and they're also very efficient, right? Because it's, it's driven by the indoor illumination section, right? So actually, a white light LED is not really white. Is a blue LED with a phosphorus coating, right? So we can find all of those wavelengths. Now we have all the wavelengths that we're very interested on uh, uh, for our sense of doing plant research, which are the UV light, right? We can find UVA very easy. We can find UVB also, but it's very expensive and very inefficient. Now, far red light, right? After, so we can see a little bit of far red, but it's after red, right? Key for plant photomorphogenesis. And we can find those too, but again, they're not as efficient. But yeah, uh, this whole research started with the with the with the explosion of the LEDs in the market. So yes. So are you saying that plants grown in artificial light are as nutritional for us as plants that are grown outside in natural sunlight? Uh, I can make it as depending how you quantify nutritious, right? If, if, if in terms of this example, anthocyanins, I can make a plant with more anthocyanins uh, than the sun uh, uh, indoors. Yes. Ricardo, thank you. thank you so much. All right. Last but certainly not least, uh, Chris and I have actually had the chance of hanging out meeting several other times uh, before this. He's spoken at some other events that I'm involved in. And I got to be honest with you, man, even though I did decently well at ECU, not too hard to do. We'll throw that out there. I've heard you talk a few times about what it is that you do, and it still just kind of goes a little bit past me. So I'm going to challenge everybody. You're probably a lot smarter than I am. But go ahead and throw that out there to listen, because I think it's cool. From what I do understand of it, it's super cool what you guys have going on. But I will read your bio and let you get going. Chris is a father, energy idealist, devoted to the cause of advancing global sustainability by changing deeply held perspectives in finance, energy, education, and business. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chris to the stage. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Chris. I am a co-founder of 3DFS. Uh, we are an energy tech and product development firm down in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. We have an advanced electronics manufacturing facility, and we identify some of the world's most challenging energy problems and look for innovative solutions. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about the sustainability of electricity. Uh, the main thing you all need to know is that we are overly reliant on electricity. 
uh, first world conditions would be impossible without it, which makes the management and understanding of electricity critically important to sustainability. It may surprise some of you to know that we do not actually measure electricity. We semi-accurately calculate it. Electricity moves literally lightning fast. And since Nikola Tesla's time, the methodology we have used is to gather as many data points as you can and then use averages and integrals to calculate the in-between. It may then not be so surprising that we have losses in the electrical grid. We have losses in generation, we have in transmission, distribution, energy storage, and consumption. They are absolutely everywhere. You know them mainly as heat and vibration. But if you think about it, that is electricity that has been converted to heat or vibration. It is electrical potential lost, essentially. And it causes us to waste an enormous amount of energy, and it costs us a ton of money. Those are big problems, but they're not the biggest problem. Instability in the electrical grid is the biggest problem. See, heat and vibration are symptoms of an unstable electrical environment. Electrical events are cascading events. They build upon each other. It's all interconnected. If you remember the 2003 blackout that put millions of people without power in Pennsylvania and New York and Massachusetts, that started from a tree branch in Ohio. So it's a safety issue. And more importantly, it's a security issue. Right now, there's just a global understanding. You don't attack our grid. We won't attack yours because we're both equally vulnerable. And that's clearly not sustainable. How many people think that that loss has something to do with the fact that we don't actually measure electricity? That's exactly it. What we have done at 3DFS is develop a live response electrical correction and balance technology. It is rooted in the precision measurement of electricity. We can measure electricity so fast that we can actually detail the contours of the individual current and waveforms in real time. Not only that, but at a microsecond level, we can actually inject and extract tiny amounts of current at precision times to maintain the waveforms at ideal. Ultimately, it is, um, <clears throat> uh, sorry, yeah, it's the lowest possible uh, carbon footprint from the usage of electricity and the highest electrical efficiency. It provides stability in the electrical network. Why is this important? Well, this is the first electrical, this is the first technology that dynamically addresses these losses in real time in one shot continuously. It essentially opens up an electrical waste market. It prevents that electricity from ever being converted to heat or vibration through precision optimization and distribution. So that opening of the waste market, how big is it? Well, think about it. We have, gen we have built the largest interconnected machine on Earth. It's built upon itself for over 100 years. It's enormous. It's incredibly inefficient. This is the first technology to dynamically recover that waste. The waste market is more than 25 times the existing U.S. solar market, writ large. This technology, we hope, we suspect, we expect, will, be, will give us access to the largest untapped energy resource that we currently don't have access to. It's the energy resource already in our homes and in our businesses through electrical waste recovery. This is what we believe is going to provide the sustainability of electricity. Thank you. Please, have questions. Questions? Yes, ma'am. So, is your product, your solution, technology patented? And if not, why not? Uh, it is, yes. We have one patent already granted. We have about 10 filed and another dozen in the pipeline. It'll ultimately be hundreds of patents. Um, I understand that uh, people like me who want to get off the grid and provide our own electricity, 
Um, are not able to sell the electricity that we produce back into the grid because it's so unpredictable. For instance, wind energy, we never know when a gust of wind is going to come along and make that power surge going into the grid. So is, is your um, gizmo, whatever it is, <laughs> going to fix that and smooth it all out? We can apply it. We can apply it to a gizmo that will fix that. Ultimately, when it comes to selling power, um, it's energy storage. You need energy storage. And with the precision control and measurement of electricity, what we do when we apply it to batteries is we are able to precisely control the chemistry in the battery and build a mathematical model so that we can see the chemistry in real time. That allows us to fully push and individually map the contour of each battery and be able to push or pull power exactly how you would require it. In comparison to today, it is orders of magnitude cheaper and more effective at doing that. Chris, that thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, how about a round of applause for all of our speakers this evening? Of course, thank you all for coming out uh, tonight. And like I said, we do this every third Thursday, so we'd love to see you back here in December. Please feel free to hang out, network, grab another drink, um, and enjoy yourselves next week. Hopefully you get to spend some time with family and friends next week. We'll see you all next month. Thank you.